person of color mm -hmm. because you've never seen Sean King and Derek Varn in the same place at the same time. Exactly. And Cuba believes that he, and, and since Jean Bajlan is going to be a person of color per the census, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. new census, Cuba is interfering with Lillian's Wi-Fi because he's like, no, I have to be the prettiest uh, white of them all. It sounds like him. It's a very Cuba thing to do. You know what I mean? Yeah. F up someone's Wi-Fi so he can be, you know, just the the, the bell of the ball. Yep. It's a very Cuba thing to do. On with the show. Good morning to most, good afternoon to others, and good evening to the viewing audience across the pond. I'm Jason Miles, your host for another episode of This is Revolution Podcast. If you're new to the channel, please like, subscribe. If you're enjoying what you're seeing, make sure to hit that notifications bell so you are constantly alerted as we're adding new shows and cross streams of other channels. Speaking of new shows, we had another episode of our White Guy Wednesday. That someone noticed that we did on international women's day <laughs> was it on purpose hmm. never know hmm. but uh white guy wednesday is with jean bajlan deep state cuba and sean king pretending to be c Derek varn please check that out that episode is up they take a deep dive into nationalism also, if you missed it, it was a spicy week for us here at TIR. We started the week off with Jacobin contributing editor and union organizer Paul Prescott discussing his latest piece on the life and legacy of Marcus Garvey. Then Thursday, we had Seattle City Council person Kashama Sawan on to discuss her stepping down after this term in Seattle and focusing on her workers' strike back organization. We took some calls in the champagne room. It was a great time. Speaking of champagne, if you want to have access to the call-in show, there's only one way. Become a patron for as little as $2 a month or $30 for the year. You can access Champagne Rooms Past and Present, Movie Night, and you can sound off in the live audience for the Mau Mau Hour with Pascal Robert. A big, massive shout-out to all the patrons and subscribers who help make the TIR community a bomb-ass place to coexist. Wouldn't you agree to, Snob? Yes, yes, I would. And the voice that you hear, but do not see, is the faceless voice of reason, M. Tucson. Hello, hello. Back to you, Jason. Before I bring in the gang real quick, uh, I was a guest on the popular show, which is up on YouTube. If you'd like to check that out, uh, it's up. We discussed my latest piece in Sublation. Um, is the contemporary left a lifestyle brand and more? And I'm a guest this Monday with Letter Hack, where I'm going to be immortalized in a cartoon drawing. Be excited about that. So please check those out. And also, massive, massive shout out. You see, see, I'm wearing my Oakland shirt, my t shirt. Short dog. Because my best friend, my brother from another mother, Coach William Liu. And the Oakland High Wildcats are now the state champions. California state champions. 
Coach Will, you did it. Got to get you on the stream soon and celebrate and talk about all things youth sports and hoop in general. Will is a genius level hoop mind. So very, very excited that uh, that Will finally won. I'm kind of bummed I wasn't able to make it up to uh, Sacramento. Um, as much as I love talking with Lily and um, I would have I would have really loved to uh, to see Will win in a Rudy like fashion or Hoosiers like fashion. Um, the Oakland High Wildcats is pretty awesome. But speaking of Oakland, Pascal's been to Oakland and he appreciates Oakland. And that's why we're friends. Please welcome the man of the Mau Mau Hour, the Pascal Robert. Peace and greetings to the chat. Peace and greetings to the audience. Peace and greetings, Jason Miles. Peace and greetings, M2 Sun. I have been to Oakland. I like Oakland a lot. I like it too. I wish I, wish I could go there. I really was, if my car was in better shape, um, this weather has destroyed the dirt hill <laughs> in which we live on, which has messed up something in my car because I would have motored up to Sacramento to see those guys uh, do their thing. I can't believe um, Oakland High won, even with NBA All-Star Damian Lillard, they weren't able to win a state championship. And he actually did an Instagram uh, a video about uh, you know shout out to the to the young men there at uh, at Oakland High saying that even his teams couldn't do it so it's pretty amazing what Will and those guys have been able to do like I said before not just athletically but also academically um, those kids are all ridiculously smart too um, not only do you have a great basketball mind coach but you also have <laughs> one of the smartest dudes I've ever been around so that's pretty cool it's an amazing combination, man. Congratulations to the team. Oh, yeah, man. Yeah, man. We got to get Will on and talk about this. Also, Tucson, I do have good news for you. Do you? Yes. Good news for you. As we're getting the show ready, we I usually like to have a pre-show topic, but I think the pre-show topic that I had dovetails in nicely about this uh, conversation about justice. So I, I had to ask some questions to our good friend, Bill Cody. And you know what Bill said to me? What Bill said to you. Is Tucson really serious about doing this the baby episode? Oh, God, no. <laughs> yeah. Because I have some insight. He goes, he's one of the few drill rap. Is it drill rap? Is that what it is? Little, little baby. Uh -huh. Is I guess he's a drill rapper, not the baby. I don't messes with the baby. I don't know any of these babies. Mm -hmm. All I know is I love my babies. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but he wants to do an episode with you about one of these Negroes. It's Young Thug. Look, man, they're all the same to me. Young yeah. Thug, old baby. Dusty draws, it's all the hell. It's all dusty draws. <laughs> Skinny dusty dickies. Draws. Skinny dickies, what they call them. <laughs> Skinny dickies dropping fire versus right. our guest today is a hip hop fan. She is, man. Mm. I saw her going into like major Twitter beef with somebody defending like Nicki Minaj. I was like, <laughs> whoa. Hell? We have to make our guest, uh, she can only speak in rhymes and like battle rhymes. <laughs> <laughs> like you can't say, you can't, <laughs> you can't, you, you're not allowed to just, you know, speak your piece. You have to say it in, in battle rhyme fashion. And we're going to just drop beats for you so you can just, uh, you can do it because your name has so many syllables. I'm sure you have a dope little flow. <laughs> <laughs> you guys can't see her in the virtual green room, but she's sitting there. You know, she's getting her bars ready to 
to drop on you. Hot 16. Before we bring in Hot 16. Socialists and justice. Wow. <laughs> Seriously, right? Was that the perfect, uh, was that the real? Uh... We, we got to set the tone for today, right? Uh, so this is what we call our Saturday free show. Just to let you guys know uh, where we go a little longer than our one hour format and head into the champagne room for further discussion. Nope. Today, the champagne is on the house. Slow socialists and justice. Our guest today believes that it's not enough to simply critique capitalism and it's many faults, but we must have a utopian vision of the future of what a just society looks like opponents of socialism or communism often equate it to a state-run dictatorship where plurality of thought go to die under the dictates of the state from her piece in jacobin let me begin by clarifying the traditional socialist objections to theorizing about justice the first worry that justice is a bourgeois ideal is well founded Claims about justice take place on a social terrain on which there are deep social divisions that liberal ideals like liberty and equality do a great deal to obscure. It is not easy to use the same ideals that obscure social divisions to argue for society's fundamental transformation. Second, as a result, claims about justice can tend to reify the status quo. It is too easy to take people's intuitions about justice at face value. The market shapes our values, sentiments, and moral intuitions in a way that reinforces the status quo, which mystifies a whole variety of social problems. In this context, it is not credible to appeal to existing norms or people's actual desires and preferences relative to those norms to legitimize socialist ideals. The third objection is that the bourgeois nature of the ideal and its many ideological distortions lead to a hopelessly reformist political strategy. The idea of, inverted quotes, justice in capitalism legitimizes capitalist dominance through the law, the courts, and the parliamentary system. So committing oneself to maintaining a political structure that reinforces support for such institutions makes it nearly impossible to challenge their social basis in a fundamental way. Radical change requires questioning some fundamental values that people now have. But socialists today should consider how our political opponents pose the problem of socialism's relationship to justice. Liberals also argue that socialism and justice are incompatible, but for different reasons. Our guest Lillian, with a C, is a postdoctoral researcher in philosophy at the Free University of Berlin with a focus on political economy, feminism, and critical theory please give a warm tir welcome to one of our favorite returning guests lillian lillian the chair chia chacharia that was worse chichar kia hard 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 speed better than the hard r whoa Whoa, that escalated. <laughs> Pascal, I'm sure you have a lot to um, to say about this. But first and foremost, Lillian, what? thank you for coming on. I know there's a huge time difference and scheduling is always a hassle with you since you chose to live, um, chose to leave us, go live your bohemian life in Europe. Um, what prompted you to write this piece? Well, I was actually interested in something slightly sideways of, of the argument I made, I made about justice. I've been researching and thinking about something that philosophers call value pluralism. So like one of the virtues of liberal societies is that they can accommodate um, incommensurable or maybe totally different values on the part of, of different people. So the classic way of thinking about this would be like a society with many different religions. Um, how can everyone live together? And uh, basically, uh, what can they agree on such that you can have uh, basic forms of social cooperation that respect everybody's rights? And this tends to be the kind of thing that 
liberals own and they say that they do this better and the reason that liberal democracies are superior to socialist states or whatever is because they can respect this basic fact of the diversity and plurality of, of human life. So like if you're on the left, you might say that this is pretty weird because it doesn't really seem to um, do that in practice. But in principle, this is like the promise of liberalism. And um, I started thinking about like what that really means. And then um, someone at Jacobin reached out to me and asked uh, me to write about justice more more broadly. So it was an invitation to write the article. Mm -hmm. And um, I started thinking about the way that we think about liberal norms, democracy, principles of justice, and um, why it is the case that socialists don't seem to be able to project a vision of a compelling vision of what we're actually we actually want mm. um, in the future, and I started to see that these two uh, problems were related. That um, the kind of hesitancy to think about justice or to think about apparently bourgeois problems like value pluralism, um, we tend to brush those things under the rug like they're superficial. But it occurs to me that in a socialist society, you will still have people with competing values. Um, unless you want to just suppress religion altogether, people probably will still have some kind of uh, some religious beliefs. They might change. They might be different. So you have to be able to say something about why your way of doing this, what you want um, in a free and just society is, is better and why people can flourish equally well or better in that society than in the one that we live in right now. Um, and I think the, the old left did have a way of, of talking about this. It was more like spiritual, more like messianic, you know, bringing forth the inevitable um, transformation of human freedom. And I started to see how romantic previous generations were and that we just seem like we're the entire opposite. You know, now we talk about capitalist realism and things are pretty dark in the political discourse. So um, I started getting, con you know, concerned about how to how to project a compelling a compelling vision if mm. that uh, makes sense that's kind of yeah Lily, i have you know thinking about this subject matter is very profound for me in many ways do you think that one of the main obstacles to allowing uh socialists or or leftist marxists or dialectical materialists mm -hmm. to have a uniform vision of their ideal society is the sectarian divides that exist within the left in terms of what they believe society should be like. For example, the social democrat compared to the actual Marxist Leninist communist compared to the actual, say, Trotskyite or anarchist, they have clearly defined differences in terms of how society should be structured. So is this more of uh, not so much a lack of vision but a differentiation of visions among differing sects within society, within socialism, excuse me. You know, I I don't know. I Like that's part of the story, but I actually am a little less generous to the left at, the, at this point than maybe you are. I don't, I don't think those visions are, are clearly defined, which is why it's <clears throat> hard to figure out what, what the disagreements about um, political strategy and medium-term goals um, versus long-term goals. I, I find these debates on the left like pretty opaque in a lot of ways. And I'm not sure that those different sects, I guess, those different tendencies do have a way of, of thinking about, about the future. Um, like it's pretty, you know, if you're an anarchist, like with all due respect, it's pretty vacuous to tell people you just want to smash the state or you want to live in a stateless, stateless society. Like, what does that mean? Um, if you're a social Democrat, we do have some idea of what that means because there's more living examples. Um, but if you, if you identify as a communist or some of these other tendencies, um, the collapse of state socialism means that there isn't a, a thing, there's not a there there to like these, these ideas. Um, so I would actually be interested to know like what you think those are because my impression is that 
there there's actually not a lot of depth to what people are hoping like to what the vision is well what what is the what does the vision mean when it's not really tied to anything concrete or anything real it, at at what point is it just you you know wishing in in one hand and crapping in another um it feels like when we talk about justice you know kind of to your point it's just a lot of people critiquing something mm -hmm. you know maybe trying to talk about quote unquote root causes um especially when we talk about let's say crime for example um there's a lot of talk and very little like action um because a lot of the the talk is not tied to anything really concrete it's just opinion feelings what do you what about cri the issue of crime like raises the the justice problem for you like what are you thinking about well, what does justice look like right yeah for for me it's always the question of what does justice look like yeah. right is a just society one in which people literally live in tents is a just society one in which you know um institutions fail to such a way that uh you know children are murdered um to the point where did you tucson you wanted me to bring something up about the a child murder right yes you want me to do that now yeah yeah okay. that was a good time you already talked Brought about it up. yeah so i don't know I, I i don't know what you get to see you know when you live in a different country you're Netflix and stuff is all different, <laughs> but there was a, a true crime thing on Netflix that popped up a few years ago that was really popular about a young child that was tortured by his mother and stepfather to the point where he died. And police were called, teachers had alerted Child Protective Services, every institution failed this child and he died at the hands of his parents. Now this happened again recently in California and a headline had popped up on my LA Times um, app and I couldn't see the kid's name so I couldn't remember the case, this new case. So I typed in child murdered by parents in Los Angeles and 15 different cases came up of children that were murdered by their parents or murdered in foster care before I even found the actual story I was looking for. How do we even address this? Because I feel that these are the things that kind of go ignored and definitely get, con the narrative gets controlled by liberal and sometimes even uh, right-wing narratives. Okay, so I um I don't know about that that case, but my my first response would be um, when you're talking about justice, it's um, I think you can interpret it very narrowly. Like you, there are different versions, like there are different silos of talking about justice. Um, there is a you know you can talk about criminal justice. You can talk about um, I, I mean that's the most obvious one, but there's different institutions. That you could imagine, and I, and I do think when you're talking about justice, you're talking about um, basic structure, basic institutions, um, but you're also talking about the ability of those institutions to self-evaluate and to um, re uh, to to engage in kind of forms of auto criticism mm -hmm. that address pressing social problems. And the reason I, I wrote my article is because the, the project of doing that, like what does a society, so, so here's the justice question. What does a society look like that takes the health and safety and like, you know, the, the cultural and intellectual potency of future generations seriously? Like, what does it mean to protect children? So I actually just read this book by Alva Myrdal, who was a um, a reformist in, in Sweden. Uh, she wrote a book called Nation and Family. And, um, you know, it's a product of its time. It was published in 1955, if people want to take a look at it. It's kind of a rare volume. But she's talking about um, 
this there's a so-called population crisis in, in Sweden because their fertility rates were going down in mid-century and she's talking about you know the right the rights instinct is to like coerce people back into traditional family structures and to um you know basically punish the poor and force people to have children and all this kind of stuff and she's looking at like how to make a response to this and i was shocked to find that 75 percent of the book is an argument about how to make the the society that she lives in safe and supportive for children and she argues that if it's a, something of value to a society that you protect future generations that you secure the conditions of their flourishing then this is going to change your entire way of looking about at family at healthcare. so it's amazing she starts with children and she starts to talk about so suddenly she's talking about education then she's talking about health care. Then she's talking about what to do about um, the disabled and how to provide support. Then she's talking about mothers. Then she's talking about. So she took this perspective of looking at what to do about like what kinds of social structures, institutions do you need to be able to protect children? So like, in a, you know, I don't think there's one answer about like what the what justice is in this case. But I think that what I'm hearing is like, there's something in a way the critical attitude is is redundant in cases like this because what you just described is horrific it's like it's it's like a moral evil that like can't um be rectified within the status quo it's a pro it's a problem of neglect abuse um like institutional decay and and so on so many other things so you might think that the conditions of justice that like what we think the terrain of this is is intrinsically inadequate to addressing the problem. But I feel like that the, there's, like in terms of a long-term vision, the question, like thinking about justice means taking a step back and asking what needs to happen to be able to make the background conditions or the basic structure such that that does not happen um, to children. Uh, and like, I feel like it's possible to, to do that and to create a kind of consensus around that being a moral and political priority. Um, and I don't think that we have a left right now that is capable of doing more than basically looking at a horrific um, injustice, demanding that it be abolished or torn down. Um, but the but the next the question of of justice is is on the on the other side of understanding injustice. You have to say, what would it be like to have a more supportive society? What would it be like to have and and that's like the question that I'm interested in um, in pursuing because I I believe that there actually can be consensus not consensus but like congealing. Uh, um, you can you can bring together, aggregate or or congeal people's intuitions um, about this, and there's ways to massage some of the more controversial uh, social um, problems that people disagree out, whether just morally or in terms of their idea of uh, family life or whatever. By saying, "Listen, children are not responsible for the Ill evils in this society. You don't have a good reason to be able to to say that they don't deserve support." And the left needs to go on the offensive about this um, because the society that we live in is is so cruel that all like it, it's almost but like every opportunity is there to be able to say that um, to, to push the conversation forward. Um, and I think the reason it gets, I don't know if that makes that. Well, let, well, let, well uh, you know, we can, we could, we could turn the page a little bit. Um, yeah. You were on this show. It's been over a year and we did a show about abortion before what well, like six months before the Alito um, thing was leaked mm -hmm. and show didn't get a lot of views. Um, great show, important show. Not your fault. Yeah, not not your, but you know, I think it speaks to kind of a reactive nature. Um, and almost it feels like a finger wagging nature and almost a moralizing nature of the contemporary left when we talk about things like abortion. 
I mean, we were really getting into the weeds on the original ruling. You know, the original lawyers, there's only one alive left, I believe, um, who's part of the Roe v. Wade decision, always said, we need to really fight to, to get this into law. We're skating on some, quote unquote, thin ice. Uh, um, and no one wanted to do anything. Uh, we talked about this on Thursday. Obama came in on codifying Roe and just says it's not a priority and never and didn't get the pushback. Why is the left so reactive and almost overly moralizing? I mean, look at when we see these snuff films of, you know, you have a, you're from Chicago. Laquan McDonald was a horrible, horrible police murder um, in, in Chicago where people came out and we want long sentences on these cops and they should be facing the death penalty. Um, is that justice? Um, no, I mean, no, like, I, I, I think that the justice conversation to me, um, I guess from a, a, a philosophical point of view is, um, much more aspirational than like, there are different areas of retributive justice, criminal justice, and often like in American society, it's such a litigious and legal, legalistic society that justice is almost equated with like fighting people in court. And um, I think that there's like, in, if, if I were to design a system, you know, there are some things that you would have to uh, specify, like in, in any society that is just, there has to be a way of arbitrary and conflict disagreement. There's going to be antisocial behavior. People are not going to be perfect. There will have to be some way of dealing with that. And there will have to be some uh, agreed upon principles and institutions. Um, but I think that, and, and so in, 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 a, in principle, you have, if you have a, a theory of justice, there are, there is going to be a way of talking about uh, what to do about things like that and whether or not there should be a court system and whether, I mean, that stuff matters, but I, I think the more, the deeper point that you're talking about is the, the narrowing of the political vision to demand uh, retribution without um, a further strategic aim about how to shift um, the dynamics of the society such that you start to address um, root causes, but that people have a sense of where they are going when they are addressing them. Like, where is the where is the left's leadership taking me? Like, what is the outcome of of all this? Um, and I think when you see, like, I think you're right to say it's it's reactive. It's um, it's reacting to cruelty, injustice, violence, um, and there's this, and the demand is just to just say just say no. Like we don't want this, and that's and that's entirely legitimate given the scope of the left. The left is so weak that it's like that. Just saying no can be um, uh, an important thing to do, but it's we are we are living in a time where like it feels like the future is like narrowing smaller and smaller. So when we say no, we have to have something that we are also saying yes to, um, whether to build a coalition around, to um, be able to identify what levers in the society to pull. Um, and I feel like a lot of the discussion is purely um, negative. Like we, we are in, in a way, and, and I'm, I'm, I do this too. I'm writing a book that's like basically a, a critique of, of capitalism. I'm, I'm not hostile to criticism. Mm -hmm. It's just in a way the criticisms are so obvious that um, the that what we are really doing when we debate about the right way of criticizing it is we are we are debating about the the details um, and the the future is what is what is missing um, and the thing about you know Roe v Wade I I haven't talked about the abortion stuff in a long time but part of the problem there is you can see it happening, this like legalistic strategy in which you're just gonna protect these very narrow form of rights in the courts. You're gonna litigate that over and over and over again. And meanwhile, the conditions under which women are having children 
or being forced to not have children because they are poor or choose, like whatever the situation is, those conditions are getting worse and worse and worse. And the only thing that people have to offer is just stop the Supreme Court from doing this thing, um, which it was going to do anyway. I mean, there's that was kind of inevitable. So it's that lack of understanding. You know, then we have this discourse again, with all due respect, like abolish the family for what? <laughs> for what? Mm-hmm. You know, and, and it's like, you're telling me that like all of these attacks on family life and on, on working class women, and this is all happening. And then it's like abolish the family. Like I see that like there's a, I, there's, there's this idea that if you just say that you need to tear it down, that that automatically entails some idea about what it, what should replace it. And I think that's where I'm, I'm not convinced of that anymore. Like you can convince me that the family form needs to change, but I don't see why the demand to abolish it is, is implying or leading me to a place where I start to see this is where people will have healthy relationships with others, where they will be, be in an environment that nurtures their children, that where they are safe, um, where they get the medical care that they need. I'm not, I'm not seeing that from the slogan. So that's what's like what bothers me. Um, not the demand itself, but that people seem to insist that these kind of negative slogans imply a, a, a positive vision. And, and I'm not sure that they, that they do. One of the things that I wanted to, I wanted to interject is that when we talk about what, what the left is lacking, one of the problems I have with that whole formulation is that the first question that pops in my mind is that what left are you talking about? Because I stand by my axiom that there is no left. Because to have a left means that you have the institutional mechanisms to actually effectuate some type of political shift in the status quo that exists in society, whether it's, you know, whether it be unions, whether it be protest mechanisms, whether it be a variety of other things. I think we have leftists. I do know we have a liberal, a liberal quote unquote Democrat affiliated infrastructure. I'm clear that they have a vision in terms of how they, they want to effectuate society and justice and it's rooted in protecting the institutions of capital. So one of the issues I have with this formulation of saying that the left doesn't have a vision. I don't disagree with that, but one of the reasons why I would say it's the fact is that we don't have a left. What we call a left in America are people who literally started to think about capitalism post-occupied. That's less than 15 years ago. That's not a left. That's about, to, that's about to, like, you know, almost 40-year-old folks who have a lot of student loan, student loan debt who are, like, not looking at good corporate jobs like a prior generation was with their level of education. I wouldn't call that a left. And I think part of the problem why they're unable to create a vision of society is that none of them have been vested in left organizing politics or structures, union membership, or or any kind of grassroots activity long enough to have a vision. Yeah, I mean, I, I actually, agree. I, I tend to, I try not to put things that s- strongly because I, I don't always... Uh, you know, some people really feel like we do have a left that's distinct from the Democratic Party and, and liberals. And I try to be not super polemical to try to make my the the theoretical point. But I actually agree with you. I think I've, the dawning awareness that we don't actually have a left um, is a very serious, serious problem. So I think that you could even interpret my argument about justice as a as a plea to start thinking about what a left would actually stand for and what it would, what it would involve. Like I, I'm, I'm with you about that. I'm, um, I don't know something about the, the, uh, the Biden years or, or whatever. I'm, I'm not really sure exactly what confluence of events has made, has made this dawn on me, but, you know, I used to be in little sectarian groups or, and so on. And, um, I used to take for granted that this left was there, even if it was was weak. And the more um, the post 2015 or post Bernie uh, constellation of forces has slid into um, very neatly into se- several two party uh, the two party narratives um, and like the le- the the far left kind of being the I don't know, like the vanguard of the Democratic Party, like ideologically and, and politically has um, has made me, I, I think that's a one contributing factor to why I would like some clarification about political goals um, and what people, a, actually, what people actually want. I have a question or a comment, I guess. Mm-hmm. And I was talking with uh, my neighbor 
My neighbor Ben. Uh, oh, he says hello, by the way. Hi. Who? Ben Burgess. Uh, oh, Ben Burgess. Hey, Ben. Yeah. Um, we were talking about, speaking of Biden, we are talking about presidents. And I was like, the last Democratic presidents since Clinton have come after kind of these insane fiasco years. Bill Clinton comes in after eight years of Reagan and four years of, of Bush senior. During those years, you have the, the first Gulf War and you have the riots in LA. You also, you can also say that he's coming in after the fiasco uh, presidency of, of Carter, where we get some serious austerity and maybe another kind of bungling presidency of Gerald Ford. So that's like 20 years. And Bill Clinton really comes in riding a, a white horse to save America, right? Tony Morrison um, is singing his praises. Black America, for the most part, is singing his praises. Um, he's also coming in after we're letting in, you know, ridiculous amounts of cheap cocaine. You have now this new market that's been created in inner cities that already had open air drug markets. They are violent places. Um, the crime bills, plural, are somewhat welcomed during the Clinton years. There is some. You know, you know, deregulation gets financial deregulation does get started under Carter with with credit cards, and it definitely ramps up a little bit with Reagan, but goes into overdrive during the Clinton years, which causes him to leave office with a economic surplus. Obama comes in after eight years of Bush Jr., who's seen as bungling said surplus, more deregulation, more war. And we're in a financial crisis where the gains of the 90s and early 2000s are lost forever. Um, and Joe Biden comes in after the bungling, I wouldn't even say bungling presidency, but the underwhelming kind of Republican status quo presidency of, of uh, Donald Trump, where he spoke in such insane language um, that it becomes kind of an embarrassment for the American people to the point where even right-wing pundits and, and even GOP um, political leaders in states are, are, they're not supporting him. So his time in the sun is gone. And it leaves us in this moment of, I would it almost as political apathy where you have a young burgeoning left that put a lot of hope in Bernie Sanders. Mm -hmm. That hope is gone. Um, Joe Biden, there was even some sort of a weird um, love affair with New Dealism and thinking Joe Biden was going to be pushed uh, into being some sort of FDR capitalist reformist. <laughs> um, and here we are going into 2024 and it feels as if no one cares and everyone's angry. Um, when you talk about Joe Biden, you know, you mentioned Joe Biden that, that just came to mind. Um, I feel that 2024 is going to be a year where just not a lot of people show up to the polls. I think so. Um, we cared for a minute about quote unquote fascism abroad. Bolsonaro's gone. Duterte's gone, but he's been replaced by probably a worse figure in Bong Bong Marcos. I never hear people talk about it. How effective is Lula going to be the second time around? Um, We've seen, you know, leaders get overthrown, democratically elected leaders get overthrown in Latin America as well. Um, it feels as if yelling about capitalism is kind of where people are because you can get some sort of moral win. 
but envisioning justice to your point about the bleakness of capitalist realism seems to be subconsciously where we are as well. I'd like to hear you guys' opinion about that. I'd like to hear the, what the others think, because I, I have one or two thoughts, but I, um, I need to sit on, sit on it a little bit. Well, I mean, for me, the way I look at the political moment is pretty much that, you know, the corporate center of the Democratic Party, the party, the the the, uh, the Biden, Kamala Harris, Clinton, Obama faction, is actually very satiated. They're very happy and they're very content. And I think one of the reasons why they're very happy and very content is that they have effectively neutralized the challenge from their progressive left in terms of the Sanders faction, which contrary to what many people realize was a major agenda behind the 2020 election. One of the main reasons why we had so many candidates in the 2020 election was to make sure that if we had to go to an actual one-on-one -on -one primary, that they would diminish the ability of Sanders to coalesce with electoral votes because they'd be dispatched to the one chosen by the party. So understanding that neutralizing, I mean, evidence, further evidence of the corporate center Democrats' aspiration of neutralizing their left challenge is the number of super PACs that were wielded by corporate Democrats to neutralize primary challenges in elections by progressives, whether it be Nina Turner, whether it be a variety of others in congressional races throughout the country. That threat has been shut down because they have pretty much forced the quote unquote progressives or leftists or DSA political faction to join with in some kind of popular front with the with the corporate liberals under the guise of we've got to fight against the MAGA Trumpists who are the biggest threat. And that strategy worked for them. And frankly, I see that when I look at, particularly in terms of the black political class, the Congressional Black Caucus, the rise of Hakeem Jeffries, I look at the way in which, you know, the way in which Biden is doling out his, uh, 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 you know, what we call fat back his, and biscuits or his uh, patronage to the black political class, moving the Democratic primary to South, to South Carolina, he is effectively negotiating a strategy to use black voters to protect the corporate flank of the Democratic Party. That's a win. That's an absolute win. So in terms of where I look at the current, current political moment, the left is dead because it never existed as far as I'm concerned. And I think the corporate Democrats have been victorious in their ability to marshal enough marshal enough political forces to neutralize their progressive flank. And when 2024 comes and Trump is running, they'll be like, do you want that guy back again? Oh my God, look at DeSantis. And people are going to run scared. They're going to come out and vote for them. Yeah, I mean, I think that one real um, shift for me, so prior to 2016, you know, I, I, I hadn't voted for a, a Democrat since the, the first time I could vote. Um, and I voted for Obama uh, the first time, and I didn't vote for him the second time. But um, you know, the the kind of the Bernie Sanders moment um, really, you know, was really challenging because for the first time, I felt like a left could congeal that was beyond the little groups I had I had been in or or been familiar with. Um, and I think that that really swept up a lot of people, right? And and I don't think it was wrong to give it a try, but like. Not at all. Like, I, I think that, you, you know, you've got to shoot your shot in a, in a way. And I, but it really shocked me how credulous people, people became after that, the quick, the swiftness with which um, becoming too critical of the Democratic Party started making you sound like a Republican in the ears of like the far left or the progressive left. That to me is a fucking freak out because I think that our job is to attack the, the Democratic Party. You know, you fight the right, but they are the right also, by the way. And I think that um, it's our job to, to attack the Democratic Party. That's what the, that's what a left would do. And you can have some disagreements about how exactly to relate to it strategically, but the, in, the credulity with which people started to buy into, um, like, uh, the 
just electoralist way of thinking. Like people started asking like, what's our strategy? Like you and the squad have a strategy together. Like you don't have a strategy with those people. That's not our strategy. What are you talking about? <laughs> um, you know, so this kind of thing, like I, I, I appreciate some of the, the attempts that are being made. I think it's hard work to try to elect socialists to office. And I think there might be opportunities and it's fine to do that. But like what I'm talking about is the way that the, the uh, the reevaluation of like did this work or not? Um, it became uniformly positive, and um, it didn't start to ask how is this shaping my my view of of the political scene? And as far as I can tell, things have ideologically just slid in really nicely to the two party back and forth, and. If you are on the far left at this point, you are basically the the vanguard of li like liberalism. Like the the biggest thing that people have to say for themselves is, "Oh, liberals say this, but they're hypocrites. We do we do it better. We're the true we're the true radicals." Um, but there there's no independent narrative. There's no independent politics. There's no independent um, way of evaluating strategies that are. Um, whether they're working or not, or like some clarification of future goals, like what are our goals that are different? Like, even if you're running um, democratic socialists on the democratic ballot line, no reevaluation of like, okay, how do our goals differ from the goals of other, uh, other movements? And are we successful? And I might be giving short shrift PSA for this, but I, I don't know. I, I've seen enough. I, I think I've seen enough. Um, enough to know that that's not really that the organs of self-criticism are not really happening like that and um every every possible policy issue every possible cultural culture war problem every possible everything it's more like it's not that we have an independent point of view and we're going to argue for how to approach this problem from a socialist perspective it means we are basically going to defend the liberal perspective but do it better than they do and then we're going to fight the right somehow and um, I don't know that that like that um, that binary trap. I think for the American left is really the big. I think that's one of the hardest problems to overcome. Well, do you think we are fighting to? You, you bring up culture wars, and uh, our good friend uh, Toure Reed uh, sent over this really great. Uh, I think it was a New York Times piece about this woman that was. Uh, shout out to uh my neighbor who you know he must be doing something because he could have just walked over here and said that but uh thank you very much <laughs> um this new york times piece about a woman who was frustrated by the tyranny of racist crossword puzzles i'm not making this up wow and she was like, we have to stop with this. Was it white people shit? I believe she called it in crossword puzzles. Um, I've been black for 45 years. And in my time, I've never, I'm not saying anyone hasn't said it. I've never heard a family member who is a fan of crossword puzzles. My grandmother's now deceased. Never said this is some white people shit and didn't want to do the crossword puzzle. But this was a i don't know where in the times uh the article was but it was a proper article um and then follow that up with an article about colin kaepernick talking about dealing with his racist adopted parents because they said that when he had cornrows as a 12 year old he looked like a thug um I remember that, yeah. th these are <laughs> Some you talk about culture war issues. Um, it feels like the quote unquote contemporary left loves fighting these types of battles. I, I think so. I mean, that I think that you know, because that with the Kaepernick stuff, for instance, the right will attack it, mock it so on and so forth that is what they are going to do and then people feel that it is existentially important to do the reverse um there there's not never really like a a pull a pullback and be like 
is this important right now? Like relative to all the other things on my, on my plate, like, you know, and you know, we, I, I think, I don't know Colin Kaepernick's parents, like it's possible that they are racist. I have no idea, but also I'm not sure what speculating about that. And because it, what you're, you're doing is you're like getting into meta discourse. Like I have no, I don't know these people. I don't know Colin Kaepernick. Um, I can speculate, you know, and so then you end up saying, okay, the right's attacking it because they're mocking it. And because it could be true, like I'm going to speculate. So I have to have sympathy for this. And then I'm going to jump into the fray and then I'm going to go back and forth with the right um, in the abstract, of course, on Twitter or whatever, like that. And, and so then you get trapped into this, like it feels morally important to stake out this abstract about this. And then my question and the question is like, and then it's never possible to ask, should I be doing this? Um, and because there, there is, and I think the thing that people feel is that there's moral legitimacy to it because there's, you should defend um, a person against right-wing attacks, but it's, it's the fact that like the, it, the structure, the discourse structure never breaks down. Like there's never an opportunity to just like think about something else now that would be important. Um, and I think that, that, that cycle of just constantly, this is what you're talking about, being reactive and just reinventing the narrative every time uh, the, there's a, a news item or a right-wing attack. Um, and it's so, and so then the discourse just like spins out of control. And I don't really know who is like, you know, to Pascal's point, who is on the left here? Because liberals are doing the same thing. Like who, and, and my question is like, if liberals are going to do that, why do I need to do it? You know? and, and and let's remember, Colin Kaepernick was a hero for five seconds as, as a leftist figure for not just kneeling, but donating large sums of money to Palestine. I uh, forgot what award, what humanitarian award he won. Um, you know, people were really, you know, really behind him in his, quote, left journey. Right. Mm -hmm. And. There's something kind of silly, in my opinion, of going, well, my adoptive parents said this thing that I found racist, and uh, that's messed up. But all in all, I mean, he doesn't hate these people. Um, he He's close with his family, but this sells books. There's a Netflix uh, special about his life. Um he was definitely able to capitalize on, you know, his ouster of the, from the NFL. But, you know, going back to the idea of racist crossword puzzles, these culture wars, as, as people in the chat kind of get dismissive about it, like you have to understand that they have value for someone. Someone feels that the pain of their ancestors is coming out in a quote unquote racist crossword puzzle. I'm so tired of this black trauma porn bullshit. This is so fucking nonsensical, man. It's, I mean, listen, man, this is people tap dancing for checks. That's that's really all it is. No, the only reason anyone cares about this garbage is because we're still stuck in this post-George Floyd moment where you can weaponize racial grievance and, and black suffering to either get a foundation grant, you know, a, a $1,500 article in the New York Times or someone to watch a Netflix special. It's it, There's nothing left about this politics. It's a fundamentally liberal politics. Politics, using to root identity in this notion that, ooh, the Nazi reactionary right is coming. Let's come together and hold kumbaya and cry about people's cornrows. That's all this is. You just I mean, mad because you can't get cornrows. I think that's why you mad. Um, so here's another example of, of this like that is a little bit more academic, just the things that people mm -hmm. focus on. So there's this discourse about in Europe, about uh, sy systemic racism, just like there is um, in in the U.S., but it's just a, a little, it's it's different. Like the the social character of it is different. That the demographics of it are different. Um, and one of the things that so so I'm going to back up. I was doing. I, I wrote a book. I have a, a book that um, I'm going to publish. I have to find a publisher. But one of my chapters is called "Is Cap Capitalism." systemically racist? Um, my answer is yes, but I, I have, you know, a different point of view from others 
on it. Um, and I was doing a manuscript workshop um, and a, a friend of mine, and so I don't, I don't mean this as any disrespect, it was an honest question, um, to ask me if I was downplaying what people normally mean by systemic racism, because I focused, you know, I'm the class reductress as it, as it were. So this is how, you know, I, I'm focusing on the macroeconomic stuff and why I think it reproduces these problems. And the, the question was, am I downplaying it? Because what other people are talking about are like camera lenses um, being designed uh, not with people with black skin in mind. Um, soap dispensers, like soap doesn't show up on your skin or the more, hey Ben, the more, um, the more like serious one example was about like urban infrastructure. Um, but I, I didn't really know how to respond to his question at the time. And I, what I wish I would have said um, to an honest question like that is the, the camera lenses and the soap dispensers are things the R&D department at a firm can fix, like given enough consumer demand, like they can get on it. What I'm talking about, which is the black hole at the center of our economy, the rut, the job polarization, the deindustrialization, the lack of people's usefulness to society, like this is like, um, I don't know why this, is, why people perceive this as to the, being the thing that isn't taking systemic racism seriously. That's much more difficult to fix, which is because we are powerless, why we focus on so many other things instead. And so like, I think maybe what I'm getting at in this conversation about justice is like that macro perspective, the big picture perspective about what a world should be like, it has to be more than the sum of all of these little analyses of crossword puzzles and so on and so forth. It has to be a way of constructing an alternative narrative of what um, both what is wrong with, but then what should society should be like instead. So that's why like in my article, I was like, I can, what are we going to do with a society in which there is growth and economic growth in only like five cities on the coasts, like Houston, mm -hmm. Los Angeles, San Francisco, New York, and like maybe Chicago, but apparently it's had population decline, which makes me very upset. But there's um, the, what are we going to do with a society where there is li literally people are languishing upwards of like 20 million people are not employed where are these people like like I, it's hard to even fathom the problem the depth of the problem is so severe that i feel like the lack of an alternative narrative to that like what are you going to do to uh make this create like a vibrant e economy a green economy whatever kind of transitional economy what are you going to do to make that happen um, I mentioned, you know, building green infrastructure, high speed rails so that people don't have to go in droves to these huge cities and, and, and everyone else is languishing in the countryside uh, and these small towns doing fuck all. And they're, they're, like in a way, it's so obvious what needs to happen, but we are so powerless that it's almost like we don't see it. We can't see it because if we see it, then we realize how powerless we in fact are. So there's, if, I don't know if that really responds to your, your point, but that's where it kind of took took me. I mean, we're having a discussion here. Pascal, I'm sure you'd like to add something. I think, I think that uh, Lillian has really hit the gold mine uh, in terms of something that's very important. Uh, one, of the, one of the shows I did uh, on the Mau Mau Hour a few months ago was to talk about white supremacy versus capitalism. And one of the things that motivated uh, the show was the ultimate conclusion I came to is that it's easy or easier to get people to find offense to things when you frame the actual agent causing the harm as, oh, it's white supremacy, it's white supremacy. but. How is, you know, how do you exactly do you talk about white supremacy when the municipal government of a city has been run for 50 years by a black political class that's now saying we want to have cop city to keep you poor Negroes in check? Decolonize your mind. That's why. Is that internal colonized <laughs> self-hate? 
Is that white supremacy? Or is that actually the fact that actors of the same race have economic incentive as a political class to work with the forces of capital to line their pockets to work against the interests of poor and working class people, whether they are black or white. And one of the things that I find interesting in what Lillian is saying is that when we discuss the nuances of how capitalism in the post civil rights age or in the age of neoliberalism is cannibalizing society across the board, across ethnicities, across races, somehow the liberal faction, the liberals and you know, the Democrats so will call you a quote unquote class reductionist or insensitive about race because you're not using decolonial theory about the way in which to settle a colonial project is internally cannibalizing the internal colony and all this other, you know, hip language that is popular in postmodern academic uh, discourse. But at the same time, when you dispatch that language, let's say, yes, we live in a settler colonial society, and yes, it's the internal colonial theory has Black people captured. But what exactly does using that rhetoric do to help the analysis of the fact that it is still the contemporary way in which capitalism is cannibalizing people that is causing this harm? Like, what do you get? Well, Pascal, you have to ask this easy question, right? And it opposes to Lillian as well. What is the function of the systemic racism? And the answer is always what? The devil made me do it, white supremacy. And then when you bring up the James Foreman Jr. argument that you're bringing up, Pascal, which is what about these black municipalities, D.C., Atlanta, for a while, Oakland, there's tons, Chicago, as chocolatey as all hell. Um, what then is the answer? And then it goes to, well, you know, some weird colonial theory. Capitalism has been out of the conversation for a long time when we talk about the rot of institutions and it becomes personal. And for a lot of people to get involved politically, it has to be personal. Do you think that's a problem if we're trying to move forward to have grand narratives? Because a grand narrative has to involve the, the greater we. And it's hard to have these conversations when everything is so personal for people. Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, I don't know if it's, it's being personal, I think in, in some ways it's it's normal because some issues they do affect different people differently and and the the what brings you into politics you know it might be in fact be quite personal um but i feel like the function of politics or political organization and then this accompanying thinking about justice that i'm you know trying to motivate is that you need to develop powers of generalization if you cannot generalize about Inter common interests, common goods. Um, you are you have an impoverished uh, form of of reasoning. Like part of what happens when people aggregate their interests in political debate, preferably in organizations and labor unions and so on, is that they start to develop capacities to uh, expand their field of vision. Um, I don't think this means like sublimating yourself and not being an individual. Um, it means cultivating capacities to be able to think about what is in the best interests of uh, a collective. And I don't think that we, because we lack a common vision and we lack a common idea of justice and freedom and this kind of stuff, that capacity to generalize is absent. Um, I can't tell you how many meetings I have been in where like it just devolves into people reminding each other about all the things that you need to be aware of. Like mm -hmm. you go to a meeting in New York, like a political meeting, and it'll be like, so one person after the other will just stand up and be like, we have to like, remember, remind ourselves, keep in mind. And it's always this like 
stuff that at this point we all know, but there's this like regurgitating effect of like, it feels good to just make sure that we all know again. And um, that's not like, but that doesn't have any effect if you don't have any, or it doesn't matter. It's a waste of time if you have no common idea of what you're trying to achieve. It would be easier, for example, um, to talk about uh, remem remembering and keeping in mind um, people with disabilities, if you actually agree, like in the healthcare system, if you actually agreed on what the what the what the policy program is, like what your vision is for the future, um, then I would have something. It would be like, okay, I'll keep it in mind with respect to an actual goal. Um, otherwise, I'm just keeping it in mind to feel good about keeping it in mind, and like that's not a power of generalization. That's um, a very inward looking way of saying, um, I'm a good person. And, and that's what I'm getting out of the political process. But we don't need good people. We need people who um, feel like they are heading toward a good society, a free society. Because in that process, I hope we become better people. We adapt better. Um, we're not all going to be good people right now because we live in a world where that's, you know, it's like Adorno says, a, a, an unjust life can't be lived justly. So the only way to start living more justly is to promote justice. Um, mm -hmm. So, so that like, that's what I'm saying. So this inward looking stuff and people act like, oh, it's just navel gazing. That's true. And then people brush it aside. Like that's not really a problem. It actually is a problem if your primary sphere of reasoning is so narcissistic. You have to be able to think outward, um, project outward. Um, and, and I think that was in the first place what was compelling to a lot of people about the Sanders campaign was like being able to project outward. But I think we've you know talked in this conversation quite a bit about how that has once more devolved. Um, but I think that the point remains, like you need to be able to go forward and outward um, Otherwise, they're, you're, it's, it, it's a self-reinforcing and negative feedback loop entirely. I, th I think also, too, we have to just kind of, you know, take into consideration this moment that Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump come on the political scene. Um, for a lot of people, Obama is dad and he's leaving for a long time. He's not coming back. And there was a lot of fear. And the people that were going to get trotted out hillary clinton probably jeb bush and at the time maybe ron DeSantis, ted cruz on the gop side are not appealing personalities and the presidential election let's just be honest it's a junior high you know election process about popularity and there just weren't candidates with a certain uh media savvy and i think trump and sanders because i do i do think they can't exist without each other they really do need each other to come out of this political moment um are really important figures because we're still spiraling after their demise political demise in the presidential arena if you will um you know, Sanders and Trump are exposing how the sausage is made in a way that we probably haven't seen before. Um, they're really speaking to the effects of, uh, of neoliberalism in a way we haven't seen before. And not just a, I feel your pain language, um, maybe more so on the Trump part, but in the Sanders part, it's like, well, I have some solutions and those solutions made sense to people to your point of the of the outward thinking but sadly the solutions and the pathway to seeing them implemented died because maybe we can't get over our own egos enough to form organizations to to fight for these things and Let's couple that with the fact that there's a massive distrust in institutions. Even before the pandemic, there was a massive distrust in institutions. So when we talk about things like Medicare for all polling well, sure, 
Sure it does. But when you ask people how that's implemented, it's going to be more bureaucracy. Those people pull back a little bit. So it, it is, when we talk about justice, I worked with the unhoused, I was unhoused, and I lived amongst them for years. So my vision of justice, I, I constantly asked myself that question every day. What does justice look like? Right? Because I felt like I lived in the bottom of a dumpster. And we got used to a certain extent, right? People want to see, look, I'm giving some food to these people. I'm doing this altruistic work. Ergo, I'm a good person. But let's just keep them there. Um, I want to fight for their rights to have housing, but I don't want that housing to have rules. <laughs> and I don't want to understand any sort of, you know, problems that may exist with putting people um, in housing because some people just can't be left unsupervised. Simple sloganeering isn't justice because I don't think we really think about what justice really does look like. Um, I think that I, one, sorry to interrupt, go ahead. No, go ahead, please. So I think that living, living in Europe has kind of turned me, not because Europe is a model, but because I think there's a stronger tradition of like the left building inst institutions here. Mm -hmm. So I feel like living in Berlin um, helped me to see, you, you see a, a, a past, a life world that used to exist. It's kind of like a ghost of itself, but it's there and it's real. So like, one of the things that I did last summer, my, my mom came to visit and we went to there. Apparently there are five UNESCO World Heritage sites of like modernist apartment complexes in Berlin. And we went to we went to one and I went to the another one um, later. And what's shocking. No, we went to three. I went to three. Um, but what's amazing about them is like you had this movement to build uh safe and clean and modern housing cheaply and efficiently for working people and um they're beautiful they're really beautiful and they were they were not they were not fancy prices or fancy materials but they're beautiful and they are humane and they were you could feel this optimism about okay we used to do we used to you know only rich people used to be able to live in sanitary nice houses um, because the material was so expensive and so on. But we've been able to uh, streamline this process through capitalist, you know, production and, uh, you know, the capitalist labor process. And now we can turn it and use it in our favor. Like we can we can do something else with that technology that is toward human ends. And like you look at that and you go by them and you think, wow, I would live here. These are really nice places. Like what's the like if I should be so lucky. And so the standards people had about what a human life needed and should be like were much, much higher. And it had a, and it was the result of them being able to think about what resources do we have? What tools do we have and how can we combine them to use them for, uh, to help working people and the poor live dignified and, and meaningful lives. And like, that that you you feel the vision that was there very strongly. Likewise, even in in East Berlin after the war, there's these huge like housing complexes, like sky, um, tall buildings, and often they're uh, they're understood to be like if you go by and you don't really think about it, you might think, oh, these are really boring housing complexes. They might have been soulless or whatever. But then when you watch, I, I watched videos at the at the DDR museum about they had like public competitions for like submitting ideas, including from students and children, like like uh, high school students about like what these houses should look like and, and be like. And after the war, they just went, they, they went for it and they started having competitions among the workers about how quickly they could turn around an apartment to make it livable for people because there was, you know, there's so many people stranded after the war that they needed, they needed to uh, do it quickly. And so the construction crews started being like, okay, we can flip this place in two days, you know? And, mm -hmm. and, and there was this sense of, um, we are gonna turn this machinery around and use it for good. 
um, some more out of necessity, but some more utopian. And like, I, I look at that and I wonder, the reason I started being interested in justice among other things is how do I capture, how do we capture that feeling back? Where, where can we get it back from? Um, and I don't know, but it, I think it's absolutely necessary, like a little bit of romance, a little bit of a feeling of like, we can make this, you know, this world uh, bend toward human needs. And if you don't think, and if you don't have a vision, I just don't see how that's going, going to happen. Uh, look, I'm in agreement with you. A yeah. friend of mine, I can now call him a friend. Uh, I'm very proud to say that Dr. Michael Harris wrote a great book called Welcome to the Rebellion, where he uses the Star Wars movies as a grand narrative uh, for the left um, and kind of talks about we don't have grand narratives. Um, I want to ask you guys a question about strategy. So this morning I'm reading an article in the LA Times about in battle city council member Kevin DeLeon, who the, it's, it's a bit of a hit piece. It's a bit of a truth, but it's also complicated. He was a consultant, which is a loaded term, especially in L.A. power politics in general, right? For, was a consultant for the AIDS Foundation, which is a massive organization that has billions of dollars. The president of which is on is, is one of the biggest landlords in Southern California. But he also dumps millions of dollars into rent control initiatives and building housing for the homeless. And part of the complaint was, and this is where it gets really weird and messy, is you know the AIDS Foundation is saying, well, we needed building permits to do these repairs. And we actually had settled out of court with some, and, and also the, I need to preface this by saying the, the uh, president of this foundation that's sitting on a massive war chest and again, billions of dollars uh, is part of the tenants union in LA as well. Um, and, and he's like, we need to, we need to do these repairs. People are complaining. The elevator's not working in one of our bigger buildings and the city's not getting us permits. He put, they put out a, they paid for a one page ad in the, in the LA times. Hey, the mayor isn't even responding to us. So Kevin DeLeon, who just walks away, walks out of a consulting position, walks into a city council position, you know, goes to city council members and goes, hey, we need to get these permits done, yada, 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 yada. yada. Corruption is the, is the cry. Um, and again, it's a bit of a complicated story. But when we talk about strategy, one of the things that we always talk about is that there's no billionaires funding left projects, right? There's no, um, there's no Tucker Carlson of the left, right? There's, there's just not these kinds of projects. There's liberal projects, right? Black Lives Matter, which you know, got a bunch of Soros money. But here we have a foundation building multi-unit housing for homeless people in the biggest homeless population in the country, in the United States, Los Angeles. And it's running into problems because of cries of corruption. Um, can we use these people on the left to get certain things done or is it always a dead end street when you get into bed with gajillionaires well so you're asking if we had like a left version of a robert mercer who was willing to like give 500 million dollars to this is a revolution podcast should we be like yo cut the check <laughs> i'm not even talking from a media standpoint i'm talking from a, a real look You'll get some housing built. You'll even get some rent control. 
you know, we can talk about what, you know, the Congresswoman uh, Sawant was able to do in Seattle with the uh, removing that that uh, thing on the rent applications that says if you're a, a convict, you you know, removing that whole line. That's important. But if you can't afford the apartment in the first place, it doesn't matter what the hell you are. So these places that are expensive to live, rent control is the first barrier. Affordability is the first barrier to even getting housing and here you have a billionaire landlord saying eh, i'll sign off on rent control i'll even build 300 units without state money that's what i'm asking can we as a left get into bed with these people or is it always a dead industry i'm just asking pascal <laughs> Lillian is smart, man. Lillian, is, she, she's like, Pascal, what do you think? Well, listen, man. Uh, Mark Engels was a petite bourgeois, uh, you know, kind of uh, well-off financial figure who was bankrolling Marx's intellectual project, to be, to be quite honest. I don't think... If we can, if you have a legitimate class trader, what I mean, a legitimate class trader, a capitalist who says, yes, I made my money through capitalism, but I believe the system is corrupt and I want to use my revenue to finance uh, projects that challenge the status quo. And I want to give as much as my revenue over to upend the system even though it's been a benefit to me i don't think you should deny deny that legitimate class trader from being a good to the system i don't see a problem with that i just think that you shouldn't position your politics in a way where you're out with your hand out looking for those donations and don't turn yourself into a kind of like ngo nonprofit mechanism where that's the mainstay of how you run your operation I think uh, I think that that makes sense to me. One consideration is that if you want to challenge like bourgeois power, you have to have some an independent basis of political organization. If there's no independent basis of political organization, then you're not going to be able to do that in the long term. So my question would always be about such opportunities. It's not that they're unequivocally they shouldn't be taken. It's more like does this enable or disable, are there strings attached here that disable the working class's ability to be independent? And the problem is, is that we don't have any independent working class. I mean, that's, I understand that they exist, but I'm talking about ones that have real social power. Like my guess is that the people who are involved in this are not independent working class organizations. So um, the question is, uh, what should your priorities be and one of them has to be balancing out incentives to take advantage of so such opportunities with the need to successfully attain some kind of independent social force that would um, be able to militate against the adverse results that come from having strings attached to billionaires, huge N NGOs, and so on. Like uh, some com compromise in politics is inevitable, but like. You have to that there, there. You have to ask like what conditions, and under what conditions can people on the so-called left withstand pressure from institutions like the Democratic Party, huge NGOs, and philanthropists? And the answer is like at the moment, not much is in place to protect the left, for, like to withstand that influence. So there's like the background question is what, what, what can we do in the medium term to to make that happen. And if hard choices need to be made, um, you have to have a long game. Like, is this going to be, uh, is this going to have payoff in the long term to be able to forego certain opportunities to be able to build a social base? There's not like one way to answer that question, but I, I guess it's not, uh, it would be kind of moralistic to just say, no, you shouldn't take advantage over of these opportunities. It would be more like, under what conditions with who and what is the medium term and long term payoffs that I am hoping to to get to get from it? 
I mean, immediately you have, was it 60,000 people on the street in Los Angeles? Mm -hmm. And you can put, let's say, 2,000 in units. You know, part of the, the, the bridge to housing that the San Francisco Chronicle wrote a great piece, I advise everybody to read it, um, is the bureaucratic burden, you know, to get one thing done in San Francisco. It could take 87 meetings and five hundred thousand dollars in in permittal approval before you can even break ground. So you know you have to start asking yourself this question: like, well, then who gets to build all this stuff, and who gets? To, why is this such a, a hard road to house people in a state where no one can afford to live, and the homeless population is growing at an astronomical rate? So I, I throw that, I don't have the answer, like you know, none of us have the answer, but I throw that out because I think more often than not, we exist in a world of hashtag sloganeering and speaking in Twitter speak. You know, I have 140 characters to get my point across. I have to play the hits, white supremacy, statistic racism, uh, capitalism. But what am I really saying and what do I really understand about complex issues like housing my guess is most people don't know that much about it i mean i think that that's kind of clear that like the um i think that when it comes to like actual issues i think the institutional knowledge that the so-called left granting all of pascal's caveats and skepticism of the existence of it i think the institutional knowledge is pretty low for the most part. Like when I talk to people in New York who really know New York politics, mm -hmm. like I'm, I'm often very, I'm like humble, humbled. I'm like, whoa, I, you know, so, um, and, and most people don't. And that's uh, that's a problem that shows you that the, that the left is in, doesn't have a social base or doesn't exist because if you can't respond vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, real things that are, ha you know, if you can't respond in some detail about what's going on and what should be done instead, you're in trouble. Cornell West says justice is what love looks like in public. What does it look like in real life? That sounds cool, but <laughs> what does justice look like? She's a busy beaver. Her name is Lillian Chichurchia. <laughs> Lillian from Chow Chilla. Um, please go check out the episode we did with Lillian a year ago about abortion. I think it's still an important episode. I think Lillian wrote a great article about it. Wherever you're watching or listening to this show later, there will probably be links in the chat, definitely in the comments for that episode. It's still hurts my soul <laughs> we did that six months prior to the leak and people weren't really fired up let's stop being so reactive get proactive um do you have any closing remarks pascal robert before we sign off Lily, i really appreciate you being on our show it's always a joy to have you on uh you know uh shout out to your deep deep bench of knowledge of hip-hop particular women's participation in hip-hop <laughs> following your Twitter your Twitter timeline and you defending your uh, argument that Nicki Minaj is the goat of uh, not only female rappers but amongst the goat of rappers overall shout out to your uh, internal knowledge of that genre I was very strong Thank you. You guys, if you guys invite me on to talk about uh, any any I mean, I think hip hop in general is like a broad interest, but um, I've been, I've, I'm an OG Barb from 2010. So um, I can, we can, we can do it. We can do a deep, we can do a, we can do a deep dive in a, another time. Lord, Lord knows my, uh, my husband is really sick of doing it with me. So give me, give me an outlet and I'm there. Well, uh, we, might have to do a show we might have to do a show on female rappers and their contribute to contribution to the genre. I will. I yeah. will gladly take that night off, especially if you're talking about newer ones. Uh, Tucson, you can you can host that show. Aww. Thank you, Jacob. Jacob says Minaj is two out of top ten 
rappers. I agree. <laughs> How? Oh my God. What is. I'm can not sure. Even I Lillian, can you dance? Can I? Da I mean, like, ca sort of, yeah. Ca ca <laughs> casually. I don't want to add. add advertise myself too strongly but i don't want i don't, don't want to put on airs we gotta have a dance off um Leah's like yo i'm italian from chicago what's your problem what's the, hey 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 <laughs> i'm walking over here hey <laughs> this person in the chat said jordan said what jason can that dance though i totally <laughs> I totally can. You I know. bet I bet you can I bet you can hard, hardcore dance, is that right? I can no, I can't do that. I can dance <laughs> dance and I can and I can do the Shakira ass shake. I've done it on screen, I think, before. Was it was that on camera that I did that? Tucson? Oh no, you were not on camera. <laughs> that was um pretty elaborate. I truly do not. I do not want to see Jason do the Shakira ass shake. I have no interest. <laughs> I did. I stood on the chair and did it. Me, please. I stood on the chair and did it. No one asked him to do that. No one asked. No one I just asked. wanted to let y'all know that this ass pops. There's way too much information, homie. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I got a movie to get to. Thanks for having me on. It was really nice talking to you guys after so long. Um, stay in touch. All right. Thank you, guys. Sure. Thanks so much, we are out. Out.